Kylie Hargraves in conversation. Kylie Hargraves is the chair of the Australian Ocean Energy Group and spoke to us about energy opportunities in Australia, the case for optimism. The forum was hosted by Idea Spies and the Centre for Optimism and Carly was introduced by Victor Purton, the COO of the Centre for Optimism. I've known Carly for over a decade. We were in that strange world of international export and uh, foreign investment recruitment where we were both competitors and collaborators. And uh, I grew to admire Kylie's uh, knowledge and wisdom and energy and organizational capacity. So it's a great privilege to have you here. So Kylie, you're now working at the cutting edge of energy and ocean energy. Would you tell us about it? My pleasure. Thanks so much, Victor. I mean, I think to start with, obviously, we will probably all appreciate that energy is an essential to any modern society. So we treat it like we treat water, food, shelter. It's a must for a modern society. The slight problem we obviously have is that traditionally, most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. So that's oil, gas and coal. About 85% of world primary energy currently comes from those three uh, fossil fuel sources. And they come with a couple of problems. Um, so first of all, they're finite, they're not limitless, and they're not universal. So we need to find alternatives that are, are limitless and universal. Um, they also come with um, an emissions problem. So even if you just want to deal with emissions for health and air quality reasons, we need to find a better way to deal with our fossil fuels. So I think um, what I'm going to do to you, for you today is take you on a bit of a picture book tour of all the exciting things that I can see in energy, including, of course, ocean energy, which is one of my favourites. Um, so I'll just share my screen to do that. So please bear with me while I just pull that up. Uh, and I did practice this. And of course, now I can't get there. Hmm. Oops. There we are. There's no problem. You've got it right there. I have. And the problem is I've got it backwards. Let's try that again. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay. So let's start with our starting point. As I said, 85% of our fuels currently come from fossil fuels. So this little pie on the um, left-hand side is just to show primary energy. And that's really important because what a lot of people in Australia will talk about is decarbonizing electricity. Now, electricity needs to be decarbonized, but it's only a small portion of the overall primary energy pie. So if we look at this pie on the left, you can see that um, there is a significant wedge there for coal. And it is true that most of coal will go for electricity purposes. Although a small amount, you know, let's say eight to 10 might be used for non-electricity purposes like production of steel. Um, but if you look at the oil wedge, which is in fact the largest wedge in the pie, most of that is actually going to transport fuels. So this is road, rail, air, and off-road um, heavy vehicles and machinery. And only a really small portion of it, like less than 1% or somewhere between 1% and 3% is actually being used in the making of electricity. So it's really important that when we talk about decarbonizing, that we don't just focus on electricity. Um, we have to look and, and work across every sector of the economy. So then if we agree that we work on all the sectors, um, the question is, you know, where can we get to? Now, I think it is possible to get to a net zero um, position. Um, the question is when, if, if we work on all the sectors, we can get to a net zero position. The question is when, I wish I knew the answer, um, but if we listen to the states in uh, Australia, most of them will have an aspirational target for net zero by 2050. So that's not that far away. So that's pretty good. But of course you can't talk about um, energy and emissions without talking about what's happened as a result of COVID-19 at the moment. This is a really interesting graph from um, the um, IEA. And basically it shows you um, that 
by the uh, by the end of this year, by the end of 2020, the estimate is that um, global energy demand will be down by four to six percent. Right? Doesn't sound great, but if you look at the graph, that's the largest drop in 70 years, and is seven times the size of the drop following the global financial crisis, which many of us may remember. In terms of em emissions. This also shows obviously a, stra a strong sh drop off because of COVID-19. The University College in London says the level of reduction from the coronavirus lockdown is similar to what will be required if we are to meet global climate reduction goals by 2050. So in other words, we need to see a COVID-19 type impact every year for the next 30 years. So I think we can do that without destroying everybody's economies, but we obviously need to change lots of things. We cannot go back to the way that we were. We have to change the way we move, the way we work. We have to change the way we power our countries. We have to change the way we power our cities. We need to think differently about some of the products that we consume in mass. But before we go all over that places, let's have a chat, a chat or a look at some of the non-traditional energy sources that I'm quite excited about. Of course, the first one there is uh, ocean energy, which I'll talk about. Um, the next, the China National Sword there is about waste energy. Um, many of you will know that in fact, we, as of one of July this year, I think it is, um, we are no longer exporting lots of our plastic and um, glass and rubber tires to other countries. And of course, hydrogen, which was, has all been in the news today. First, ocean energy. Um, oceans cover 70% of our planet. Um, you can generate energy from waves, tides, currents, but also from harnessing things like differences in temperatures um, and or salt concentrations. So where rivers meet the sea, so osmosis can actually give you energy um, to power you know, small, small monitoring equipment. Um, you can put ocean energy devices on the sea floor. You can put them floating in the water column. You can put them on top of the waves. You can attach them to offshore oil and gas rigs or offshore wind farms. Um, and in some locations, you can place devices to actually help with coastal erosion. So because they take the energy out of the wave, it reduces the amount of coastal erosion as it hits the shore. So if that's something that's important in a particular area, then this is another way that it can add value. The International Renewable Energy Agency, in fact, noted that, and I'll quote it, the potential of oceans as an energy source is staggering, more than sufficient to meet total global electricity demand well into the future. So it could look after an entire secondary energy source in electricity. Now, Australia is the world's largest island. We have over 22,000 kilometers of coastal areas, not to mention we have the world's largest economic, exclusive economic zone, which is um, sovereign rights to about 200 nautical miles off the coast of our country. The water surrounding us gives us potential for energy, hydrogen, heating, cooling, fresh water, believe it or not, no one drinks salt, but it does. It can give us drink, uh, fresh water and other project products such as oxygen. But unlike in the UK, where over 80% of the public are supportive of ocean energy, especially in partnership with offshore wind, Australians are virtually unaware of the opportunity that we are surrounded by. Ocean energy is far more predictable than solar and wind. Tides are predictable over all timeframes, thanks to the moon. <laughs> and waves have a forecast horizon up to three times um, more reliable than wind. So how can it be used? The little circle on the left hand side shows you all the different sort of applications for ocean energy. Um, for example, you know, some, some of it's really niche. So if you think about offshore monitoring and observation, if we can harness the ocean, um, the energy in, in the ocean, we could have um, endlessly operating autonomous vehicles. So they could be surveying the, the seabed, they could be monitoring the water, they could be monitoring offshore fish aquaculture um, operations and working out when you need to feed the fish. 
et cetera, things like that. Um, but the potential that I'm really excited about, um, which is actually a bit more um, large scale, is, is actually about an integrated energy system or more like an independent system for coastal um, island and um, uh, coastal and island communities. So if you think about it, a community with an integrated energy system which can combine um, wind or solar, depending on what's more prevalent in the, in the island area, plus ocean energy and batteries could, could actually deliver to a community their own fresh water because you just need the ocean, you need the ocean and power to produce um, desalination. They could have their own hydrogen, which could displace diesel, which is used a lot in coastal and island communities and is very bad on emissions. You can use the oxygen from the hydrogen production to help with your waste water treatment uh, for the community. Um, you can have the energy to power your houses and your businesses during the day and during the night when sol sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing, the ocean can actually recharge your batteries and you can do it all again the next day. So if you think I'm dreaming, have a look at the Orkney Islands in, uh, in the UK just to see what's possible. They have gone from being a diesel dependent community to basically being independent. Um, and thinking about ocean energy contributing to resilient, you know, fast disaster recovery, independent, protected, decarbonized communities all around the world is fascinating to me and a huge potential export industry for us. But as I said, I could talk about ocean energy for hours and I won't. <laughs> so moving on. <laughs> Waste energy. Okay, according to the World Bank, um, over 2 billion tonnes of municipal solid waste is produced each year, and it accounts for about 5% of global emissions. Almost half of that from methane from landfill, um, predominantly, obviously, from uh, organic waste. There are already 2,500 waste energy or waste to fuel plants all over the world. And one I wanted to highlight here is on the right-hand side of the slide, and I've put, put the link up there because it just blows my mind. There, it's a, um, it's a place nicknamed Copen Hill. It sits in Denmark, um, right near the residential and cultural center of um, Copenhagen. It is not only the world's cleanest waste to energy facility, it has a man-made year-round ski slope, the world's tallest climbing wall, and hiking trails all over the building. <laughs> um, so it is a, an absolute um, landmark for the city. Uh, about 60,000 people are anticipated or have um, used the ski field hiking trails or climbing wall in its first year apparently. Um, and it's really close to residential areas. It's, its emissions are essentially steam, which is just mind blowing. On the left-hand side, in Oz, when you talk about Oz, we're a little bit late to the party. Um, we probably have about 20 waste energy projects under operation, construction or, or discussion. One in Melbourne, uh, one in um, Victoria is the Yarra Valley Wallet Waste Energy Project. Um, this is about taking 33,000 tonnes of commercial food waste out of landfill each year, so keeping it out of landfill. It produces enough electricity to power about 1,300 homes. But in fact, it uses the electricity to power the, the sewage treatment next door to it. Uh, and if it's got any excess energy, it exports it to the grid. So emissions from these sorts of waste energy power plants are increasingly um, uh, fantastic. I had another slide, but we won't go into it, where you know, SOX, NOx and carbon are so low and well below New South Wales uh, air quality thresholds. These are things we need to look, about, look at in Australia. Hydrogen. Um, hydrogen's been around for ages, uh, but predominantly as a raw material in industrial processes. So what's new and sexy about hydrogen? Um, well, what's new and sexy is that we're thinking about it as a way to replace that oil wedge. So the oil wedge that we saw at the beginning, which is predominantly about transport, um, is, is where we're focusing, but also potentially in some electricity um, and gas uh, uses, uses and in manufacturing. So what's also new about hydrogen is how we think about producing it in vast quantities. 
So we're having a lot of discussions about brown hydrogen, which is using fossil fuels to split the molecules, um, blue or gray hydrogen, which is using fossil fuels, but combined with things like carbon sequestration, or green hydrogen, which uses renewable energy um, to create hydrogen. And of course, whether we use seawater, wastewater or potable water is also um, discussions that we're having at the moment. So we've seen the National Hydrogen Strategy um, and today's Technology Investment Roadmap. I won't go into hydrogen. There'll be people in the audience that are much better at it than me. But in Australia, there are about 16 hydrogen projects underway, looking at things like hydrogen fuel cells for cars, um, hydrogen international natural gas pipelines, um, storage capabilities, and of course, renewable energy as the, as the energy source. Um, there's also a lot of really cool international examples. The latest one, which sounds too good to be true, but I'm hoping it's not, is um, a hydrogen, the largest green hydrogen production plant in the world due to open in Lancaster, California. Um, not only does it claim to be the largest producer, it will be using bioenergy from recycled paper waste um, to, to produce the hydrogen. And as a result, according to the company, this process means that it will result in even lower carbon emissions and um, significant cost savings when compared to producing hydrogen from solar or wind. So watch that space. Um, according to C40 Cities, which is a network of 96 of the world's largest cities, um, cities occupy 2% of the world's landmass but consume over 60% of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of global emissions. So we need to do something about that. Um, obviously planning is key, moving people around, um, what sort of building materials are used, low carbon concrete, um, what sort of utilization rates are there in, in for cities infrastructures? Can you have dual or multiple purposes? Um, how are the utilities being managed, internet of things and data analytics, all that sort of good stuff. I don't know about you, but in March when we went into lockdown, I went past so many buildings where all the lights were still on, the escalators were still moving, and I just thought, what, what's going on? These poor buildings have smart elevators, but probably not smart buildings. Um, so there's a, there's a company, Australian company, that I've had on my radar for a long time called Switch Automation, which I think is great in this space. They basically try to remote control the entire commercial building, whether it's a supermarket, residential or office building. So everything, your utilities, lighting, heating, water, um, elevators, car parks, everything, real-time data, real-time fault reports and real-time control from your laptop. It's going, to, it's going to result in much better energy efficiency. So pretty inspiring, already commercialized, readily available. Um, getting, getting to the last bit, alternatives. We've touched on some of the new energy sources, energy efficiency, um, and particularly in our cities. Uh, as, and now just lastly to touch on alternatives to energy intensive products. Two of my favorites in this category, concrete and plastic. Uh, a BBC report um, in 2018 on concrete, noted that it was the most widely used man-made material on the earth. It was second only to water as the most consumed resource on the planet. Um, the industry has constantly been trying to find ways to reduce its emissions and that's great. Um, one of the main ways they've been using is, is actually waste to energy. Uh, but that's only re resulted in about an 18% 18, 18 reduction in emissions for the industry. If the concrete industry was a country in its own right at the moment, um, it would actually still be the third largest emitter in the world behind China and the USA. Apparently, I feel quite guilty about this, nearly three tonnes of concrete are used annually for every man, woman and child. Uh, it, we, Concrete accounts for about 8% of global emissions, and it takes about 800 kilograms of CO2 to produce one tonne of concrete. So if you're going to concrete your driveway, please think twice. Anyway, the reason I've got it there is um, the Uni of New South Wales has developed a high density, low carbon geopolymer concrete using fly ash and steel furnace slag, uh, an industrial um, waste product from the steel industry. This is great because high density means less concrete is actually needed. 
um, potentially up to 50% um, less than, than usual. High density also means high resilience, um, which is especially important in marine environments. Uh, so structures last longer, further reducing maintenance and replacement. So again, reducing emissions. Um, and it also uses industrial waste products as ingredients instead of virgin inputs, which is fantastic. Plastic, oh my God, where do you start with plastic? Um, it's wonderful, we love it. Um, cheap, lightweight, versatile, strong. Um, can't imagine going through my day without touching something that has plastic in it, um, but it is hugely emission intensive and a massive waste and pollution problem. Uh, apparently since 1950, the world has produced 8 billion tonnes of plastic. Um, the World Economic Forum believes plastic production could quadruple between now and 2050. That increase would equate to 50 times the annual emissions of all the coal-fired power plants currently operating in the US. The biggest sectors of plastics are packaging, which we're all familiar with, building and construction and automotive. Even worse, only a very small percentage of global plastic is actually uh, recycled. There's lots of work on biodegradable and compostable plastic alternatives um, with you know, cornstarch, milk, casein, and all sorts of weird, wonderful things, as well as a focus of switching to more sustainable um, products like bamboo. But what happens to the roughly six to seven billion tonnes of waste that's now sitting in our landfill and our, our oceans? Um, Again, I've picked an Aussie one here, um, gone international to commercialise, but it was originally developed by an Aussie. Um, Lysella Holdings uh, has developed a plastic recycling technology that can create recycled oil from waste plastic in 20 minutes. So its chemical breakdown process apparently produces 45% less emissions than traditional incineration um, waste energy processes and there's lots of different types of waste energy processes but incineration is one of the oldest and the oil is easily blended with conventional oil they can do the same process to create biofuels from pulp and paper how cool is that um, so <laughs> that was a picture book whistle top whistle whistle stop tour of some of the exciting things in the energy space i like um, clearly, we have lots of ways to get to a net zero future, uh, especially if we keep an eye on decarbonising across all the sectors of the economy, not just electricity. And isn't it wonderful that we can start straight away? Absolutely brilliant. Um, that was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the partnership between Idea Spies and the Centre for Optimism bringing you thought-provoking topics with the lens of optimism, innovation and positivity. We'd love you to join the Centre for Optimism. Uh, go to the website, have a look at our materials and if you'd like to join as a member or subscriber, um, click on the Join Us bar and uh, we'd love to have you part of the optimism movement. <laughs>